My name's Andre. My name's Rahia. My name's Sarah. We are students at the London Academy of Excellence, Tottenham, and we are going to be discussing race, depictions of race, or poor depictions of race in English literature. Uh, but first, we're going to address what triggered this whole global discussion about race this week, this month, this year. And that was the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis in the US. In a recent video shared millions of times in social media, he was shown having a knee on his neck by police officer Derek Chauvin. And it took eight minutes and 46 seconds for him to die. And before he died, his last words were, I can't breathe. The reason why he was arrested was due to him allegedly using a fake $20 note in a shop. And this has sparked worldwide discussions about police brutality and racism in general in the workplace and education, etc. I'm also going to use some statistics on the use of police brutality or the criminal system against black people in the UK. The most recent statistics from the Home Office and Ministry of Justice show that in 2018 to 19, black people were more than nine times as likely to be stopped and searched by police as white people. They were over three times as likely to be arrested as white people. They were more than five times as likely to have used force against them by police as white people. And a quarter of the prison population comes from black and minority ethnic backgrounds despite representing just 14% of the population. In young offenders institutions, this increases to 50%. So I want to open the floor to Sarah and Rahia. What are your thoughts on everything that's been going down so far? Sarah? Oh, <laughs> hello. Um, so basically, um, yeah, uh, I kind of just think, what did you expect? Um, so not only do Americans have the pandemic, just as everyone else worldwide has the pandemic, the UK and the US has the pandemic, which is has already caused um, you know a degree of fear and sort of uncertainty. Um, on top of that, you are reminding uh, African Americans that not even a pandemic can save them from racism. A literal pandemic where you should be inside and what you should be worrying about is a virus. Um, now you're reminding African Americans that on top of that, they still have racism. And, you know, a lot of people have sort of said, well, you know, this has been blown way out of proportion. A statistic that's often be used is that in America, yes, statistically speaking, white people are um, make up the majority of police um, inflicted deaths. But as kind of similar to UK statistics, uh, black people are um, disproportionately killed compared to the population that make up of America. So it's like, I'm not surprised at all that this has happened. This has been a building sort of situation. People are angry, people are scared. And on top of that, the slap in the face is that you reminded them that they are still not equal. They are still not treated right by the very land. They're still not safe in the very land they are part of. So um, am I surprised that it's a, it's, it has erupted in um, looting and rioting in violence? No, because violence is the language of people who have not been unheard, who have not been heard. So it's like, um, whether I agree with the looting and the violence and destruction it has on neighborhoods and the um, fear it also creates, that's another question, but I'm not surprised that it has happened not at all. I feel very overwhelmed. I mean, you go on social, social media and you see loads of tweets and photos and it's quite graphic images that they're using as well to show us how brutal black people are being treat, treat, treated in society. And on top of that, the idea that some people can't comprehend that this is a real issue, they can't acknowledge it because it, it would then mean that they're all of a sudden admitting to having a privilege and that makes them worse or that makes them a less better person or a bad person for acknowledging that they have something over us and so i guess that could lead us into our first question does literature have a role to educate and inform readers about the lives and experiences of people from other ethnicities races or communities and i guess maybe a part of why people don't understand the reality of 
the reality of the hardship that black people face is because they haven't been exposed to it the curriculum is so whitewashed and people don't see that their lives people don't see their lives being represented in books and in plays and it just becomes a place for white people to have their fantasies shown mm. in. Mm. yeah um, I'd so say... one of the questions we were going to discuss is oh sorry andre oh no it's fine you go ahead no no give me a page <laughs> well, i was just going to say that i feel like literature definitely does have a role to educate people um when we look at race or the depiction of race especially within the school curriculum most of the time it could be from the perspective of someone who's white and doesn't necessarily know all of the hardships or the, the life journeys because it's not always hardships but the, the life of a of someone who's black or from um another minority and i feel like in my journey um in with english literature i have only been impacted i've only been exposed to proper writing from black people um this this year with um coursework i'm reading curriculum hadn't really exposed me to this before and um, the books in question are A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry and Behold the Dreamers by Mbolo Mbili and these books and the way that they deal with the issue of race and class because a lot of the time we tend to think of them as separate things but in reality they can be very much linked and the way that people sometimes view you know, race is something that people can leave if you move up a certain class and then you won't have to share the struggles. Mm. But I feel like it's something that can bridge those gaps. Mm. I feel like in those two texts, it's something that I personally related to a lot, dealing with themes of cultural appropriation, cultural appreciation, potentially, um, the idea of race traitors. Um, it was something that I found interesting. And I feel like it's something that educated me, someone who's black, on you know, the way that black people can be perceived within Western society. Mm. I would just like to clarify that um, I've seen a lot of confusion around the Black Lives Matter um, kind of the kind of whole movement. And one thing, obviously, every, most people would know about the counter that is All Lives Matter. And um, there seems to be this confusion or just maybe deliberate ignorance, maybe one or both, about how, about the kind of point of Black Lives Matter. And what people seem to immediately go on the defense of the knee-jerk reaction seems to be, well, all lives matter, all lives matter, you know? And of course, Black people are not, it's not Black Lives Matter only, it's not only Black Lives Matter. If anything, we have to add an extra word, it'll be Black Lives Matter too. The point is, if this house is on fire, we are going to put out the um, fire at this house. Every other house is not on fire right now. This is the main priority for us right now. So people who kind of try to counter the protest by that protest is sort of like, right, you're, you're protesting something that should be part of all lives matter. Black lives are part of all lives, but we're focusing on black lives because because they're under attack. Mm. So like, that brings me to the question of talking on literature, like does literature have a role to sort of inform about, you know, kind of like um, the lives of people we usually don't get the perspective of, not just black people, but you know, poor people, um, people who are maybe even higher up the one percent you know people whose lives we don't usually get because the majority of the population is somewhere in the middle mm. so yeah i guess the magic of literature comes from experiencing a new reality and as much as people use literature to educate themselves they also use it as a form of escapism and i just want to like refer to james baldwin's dark days and he made a distinction between education with the lower with the lower letter E and education with a capitalized E and he said education with a capital E is what the government allows you to know and even in the book I'm reading now Between the World and Me by Coates um, he said that he was made for the library and not the classroom because he has this understanding that school teaches compliance and even as he was sat learning French he couldn't help but wonder how useless it was because nothing suggested he'd go to France or meet French people. He was always condemned by the streets. And 
he just knew it was a death sentence. And it's, yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. So do you believe, like, um, sorry, Andre, do you believe, like, um, therefore, the literature that you read around kind of James Baldwin and that kind of thing, so do you believe that education, you know, with a small e, like just basics that we learn versus education with a capital E, what, you know, that kind of education, do you think, which one do you think literature fits into, like? I'd say literature is the product of the interaction between education with the lowercase e and education with the capitalized e. And I say that because literature is very real. I mean, it comments on the society that we live in, but it also, it also like uses a lot of the imagination. And I say that, um, I say that literature, literature's role is to both educate, but also to to question and challenge your position in the world in like a philosophical sense, but also a poetic sense. Mm. In poetic sense. I definitely agree. I feel like something that you can't really achieve in real life is often putting your place, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, you can try to simplify as much as you can, as much as you can try to at least, but something that literature can allow you to do is at least gain some level of understanding of what it can be like to see something from someone else's perspective. Mm. And then in terms of your earlier point about um, not seeing, you know, the, the different level the different perspectives from different parts of society because often you see people who are in the middle talking about life in the middle but not people at the bottom talking about life at the bottom and i feel like that also has something to do with the exposure of or education of people in those different sectors of society like at, to what extent is it enough so that they can actually write about it in influent or prose or, or, or will people actually want to read it or will they judge it depending on whether it's well written or whether it can you know sell well in a, in a bookshop and i feel like that's something that i really admire about chinua achebe's things fall apart it's the fact that he as an african man specifically chose to write in english because he knew how far it would reach in that language that in itself i feel is a political statement because he could have easily written in a different language. He could have written Nigbo, which is his native language, but instead he wrote in English because he wanted to change the narrative of Africans, of Nigerians, from being something that's very passive and something that, you know, slavery happened to it. And then he tells something what happened before that narrative even came into place. And I feel like that's something that resonated with me quite a lot because when my dad recommended I read it, I just thought it would be, you know, a standard run-of-the-mill book because I didn't actually read the title probably or I didn't read the author's name probably I just saw a book he was presenting to me but when I read it when I did some research on it that's when I actually internalized what that book meant to me mm. I have a quote from James Baldwin's Dark Days and I wanted to ask you both what you thought of it is that okay yeah yeah, yeah. okay so he says the educational system of this country is in short designed to destroy the black child it does not matter whether it destroys him by stoning him in the ghetto or by driving him mad in the isolation of Harvard. Mm. I resonated with that last bit. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, we're not in America, but um, yeah. Uh, you know, all of us are on our way to really good universities, or should be on our way to good universities. You know, speaking as someone who has an opportunity to go to Oxford, that is, um, something that that is just something that resonates with me right now because just waking up and looking at my at the news a news feed um apparently there was an incident where you know george floyd's death was used as a joke as part of um a joke in um to do with uh, an, a, some kind of election in christ church which is a college in um oxford mm. and they were talking about you know sort of um uh, classes that they use on um per, members of Christchurch and also to reduce that sort of racial bias. Um, so, yeah, definitely there is that idea, I think, in terms of, like, me, as we all discussed, sort of that kind of idea of ethnic minorities do have um, 
this sort of uh, idea around them that they are lower class, that they're not educated and things like that. And I think that we tend to lean on our culture a lot because that is basically what we have. You know, from American, from black and African Americans who, so black African Americans, from African Americans who have had to create their own culture because it has been, it was dismantled for for them and it was taken from them, from, you know, black British people, other, you know, ethnic minorities in Britain who had to migrate to another country and take their cultures with them. That is the sort of thing of us leaning into a culture. So when you have like, um, children or just people of ethnic minorities who then aspire to these high places like Oxford, Harvard, you know, these predominantly white spaces or that are associated with white higher class, we do have people from our culture who might um, decry us or who might kind of dismiss us as trying to um, assimilate or trying to adhere to what the white man wants, for example. But at the same time, it's like, as Andre said before we started this recording, why is education, you know, why is success why is wealth associated with being white? And at the same time, you have people who then complain that we have marginalization. But people from your own community are the people who are you know, sort of shaming you for trying to reach those spaces. In fact, trying to create the path, lay the path for people from your own community to reach this, those spaces as well. Why are we trying to have integration, but then also have polarization? Mm. I 100% agree. My level of education does not subtract from my blackness, and I think you guys would both agree. Definitely. Absolutely not. You know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it would be reductive to think that all literature pr produced by black writers needs to be about race, or at least about the racial struggles that are faced. And so, like, is there a space for novels that are more celebratory and don't focus solely on race? I feel like in the curriculum, there definitely is. Um, Afrofuturism is one genre oh, yes. that I feel like it could be implemented in um, uh, the, the curriculum because I feel like if you think about it, although it does look at race and it does use, you know, traditional African names, for example, it doesn't paint it as a struggle. It doesn't paint it as something, you know, it doesn't paint it as a typical slavery, typical mm -hmm. civil rights movement, typical police brutality. So it looks up it looks forward it looks to the future it, it uses if you look at harry potter and you look at the world that creates why can't the same be said for these afrofuturistic books why can't that be promoted as heavily as those types of texts and it's just some, i feel like that easily there's a space easily for that to be put in yeah definitely like oh sorry here do you want to say something no no go on okay i was gonna say often yeah like there's often this idea to do with ethnic minorities, especially um, the black culture, that it's either we can't look forward because we're so focused on the past and the injustices we face in the past, or if we do look forward, we have to let go of the past and ignore the injustices we face. And that is just not the case. You know, for example, when we had something like Black Panther come out um, mm. and there was, you know, I don't think people understand how significant it was for black people. It wasn't just a Marvel movie. Mm. Some people who were going to see Black Panther, my dad and I went to go see Black Panther. My dad does not know who Marvel is. <laughs> I said, dad, it's a Marvel movie. He was like, who's that director? I was like, dad, no, you know? But when he saw it and we left the cinema, I was such an awe. And my dad, like an hours later when we got home, he was discussing back to his African friend back in Nigeria about how, oh, this is revolutionary. He's never seen anything like that. And it wasn't just because we were seeing, you know, dark skinned black actors being portrayed as intelligent, high tech people. It's because we were also seeing a version of Africa that never has been an Africa without colonialism, an Africa that has that would have been allowed to um, develop in its own time, an Africa that does not have the influence of people who mistreated them and hurt them, you know? Mm. And it was, I cannot tell you how it felt to kind of see that. Like, not only, uh, talking, moving on from Black Panther, there was also a movement called Afropunk, which I discovered when I was, um, you know, about 15, and I fell in love with it because, you know, again, going back to the whole um, kind of, okay, if you don't, act stereotypically black or white. Afropunk was something that was, it was a space for me, it was a movement I loved because it did mix African culture with, you know, alternative punk rock culture, you know. I, when I saw pictures of the festival, it was like people wearing, you know, um, dashikis, but they're also wearing Doc Martens, they had studs, you know, they mm -hmm. had um, like uh, skulls like on their chokers and stuff like that. And it was people, it was black people who were doing rock music, but also had Af African influences in that rock music. 
why do we feel again the need to separate or sort of um why do we feel that again the need to polarize black culture from any other thing that we don't consider black what is black and again why do we feel the the um the fact that if we look forward we can't keep our past and if we look at our past we can't keep our future like mm. that is not realistic we can have both we can look at how you know there are systems in place that have hurt black people and we have literature that does that we have literature that, that addresses that but we can also have literature that just looks at how it is to be a black girl without race i have not experienced racism except from the internet right mm. so i want to see someone who is just a black girl who's living her life because that's who i am as well as seeing a black girl who goes through racism because i have gone through racism online i have gone through subtle types of racism but just because i don't have someone shouting the n-word in my face doesn't mean i haven't gone through it you know what i mean mm. so yeah. okay i'm gonna move on to our next question if andre you don't have anything to say oh no no okay does the influence of English or Western literary canon mean that schools and universities keep teaching the same old texts that often feel irrelevant to younger readers from a multiracial Britain? I'm a bit torn on this question because mm. I definitely understand the significance of the likes of Shakespeare mm. or Gothic texts in the, in the impact of literature, the, the effects of literature today. But at the same time, I feel like right now in 2020 we're at a turning point mm. where we can also look back like there's so much there's so many other texts which also could bear that same significance mm. but it's not always going to be from a white old man who, who who's even dead there there were people who were alive and have written <laughs> excellent texts mm. and they're from multiple ethnic i feel like sometimes the people in in charge of education forget this yeah and I feel like it could really help expand the eyes of a lot of young people, whether they come from an ethnic background or yeah. they don't. And it's something I feel like should, I feel like it's something that could definitely change. It's something that could definitely change and it could leave a positive impact. It could open people's eyes from a young age. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily have to be explicitly about the hardships of certain minorities. As long as it comes from multiple perspectives, that's all that needs to be done. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that because I feel like if if at my secondary school I said I enjoyed Shakespeare, like everyone would be like, what? But like, he's an old white man and you can't relate to anything he says. Like Hamlet is about a Danish prince with, you know, he thinks too much and he's obsessing <laughs> over his... <laughs> he thinks too much. He thinks too much and he's obsessing over his mother's sex life and it's insane, right? <laughs> But at the same time, I do enjoy it. And it's not that I relate to it, but it's a time where I haven't seen. And if I do enjoy that, am I then neglecting or betraying a part of my identity? Because I'm not paying the same homage to like uh, to black literature. Because mm. I'm just not being to play devil's advocate here, just, yeah. you know, quick. Some people, an argument that might come up is that, well, yeah, it's all good and everything that we, you know, try to learn about the perspective of minorities and support, you know, books about minorities. But the majority of, you know, um, Britain is white, just like, as Andre said, you know, black people only make up like 14% or something like that. Mm. So someone might argue, why do we need to care so much if that's just the minority? There are a minority for a reason. They don't make up the majority of the country. Like, it's like going to Nigeria or it's like going to, you know, somewhere an African country or an Asian country and saying we need more white literature in here because you know this is the white perspective and we have white tourists and we have white people who live here so you need to understand the white perspective as well so what would be your kind of you know how would you respond to that I feel like there's a place where white literature and black literature and black literature can coexist I don't feel like one has I don't feel like they're mutually exclusive and on top of that I just feel like um Sorry, wait, it's gone from my head. <laughs> um, I it's feel... Expanded, like... yeah. Ooh. Sorry, repeat the question again. Okay, so some people might argue... Well, oh, I remember. Pretty... <laughs> sorry, sorry, I it? remembered. You got it, girl? Yeah. Okay. Good. Go ahead. So, so, I think it's a problem when white literature overshadows black literature and then it can invalidate the minorities and make them feel like their reality doesn't exist or their reality isn't as important as the reality of their peers mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. definitely agree because if you think about it through most of history 
a lot of these, a lot of texts, even even nonfiction, it's been written from one perspective in Britain, particularly. It's been written from one perspective, and a lot of the voices of other ethnicities has been very much silenced and erased to an extent. Mm. And I would even go as far to call this some sort of collective social amnesia, where mm. people have, due to social conditioning, have forgotten a lot of these parts or haven't even learned about it. And I feel like definitely because of the fact that, you know, Britain, for the most part, is very much white, I feel like that doesn't necessarily give people in Britain the excuse to not want to learn mm. about other ethnicities. Because in this world of globalization, you can't stay an island forever. Digital technology exists and you expose yourself to, you know, people from everywhere. So why should we choose to make ourselves ignorant to an extent, ignorant mm. to all these other minorities, even specifically through literature? Literature is something that you can, you know, explore these things even more easily through and understand. So I feel like there's a there's a responsibility for the government, even though, you know, they have a priority to make it, you know, British text, English text, they could still go out of their way to, you know, I don't want to say reparations for the colonial past, mm. but at least education, for, you know, the future generations. I don't want, you know, a, a, a future where there's absent-minded, you know, isolationists. Mm -hmm. mm. I definitely agree. Like, you know, I think, um, I will say, apart from just, you know, how there is, like I said, you know, a majority white population. So the majority have a white history and they would like to focus on that because, you know, we would like to focus. I, would, I can understand the perspective of wanting to focus on your country's history. And, but from a practical standpoint, if you think about it, writers, people who have been writing, um, educating people whose perspective has been allowed to be heard, even people who have been educated the longest has been white people in Britain, you know? Like, if you think about the long history, if you think about Shakespeare, who, what, what Asian or black writer was also writing along Shakespeare? Like, yeah. I can't name one. You know, what Asian or black writer were even, was even allowed to get even to the, you know, to the level of someone like, um, what's his face? Webster, you know? Yeah. He was, you know, okay, I, okay, no one got up to Shakespeare's level, but I have never heard of any black writers around Shakespeare's time, or Asian writers around Shakespeare's time. So I kind of understand um, the kind of focus on quote unquote British literature and the kind of mostly white authors and playwrights because they have been the people who have had their work out the longest. They have been the people who have been allowed to have their work championed and sort of, you know, um, integrated into the sort of society and sort of culture of Britain the longest. In another 50 years time, another 100 years time, we will most likely have more people of colour, more um, you know, ethnic minority writers, playwrights and everything, having their work integrated in the culture. But I do get the fact that, well, a lot of us don't want to wait until 100 years time because we're going to be dead, yeah. you know? So we want to see that kind of integration and change now in our lifetimes because this is, the, this is the time when we are trying to be so progressive and we're trying to consider different perspectives on things. This is the time to start to change things and try to make things more diverse. Yeah. and try to reflect the actual vo um, voices of Britain. Yeah, I'm um, even just taking a look at the units available for Bristol, Bristol's English programme, right? And there's a unit called Contemporary Multi-Ethnic Writing of America. And, you know, I appreciate that they're trying to diversify the syllabus, you know, but at the same time, it, it almost feels like there's a part of the history of multi-ethnic people that they're neglecting. And it's only now that it's become a thing, but people have been writing for centuries. So where is that gap? Mm -hmm. Like we've had things like the Harlem Renaissance in America. Are you telling mm -hmm. me that there was no sort of revolutionary writing in Britain? You know, mm -hmm. like that's another thing. It's all well and good to you know, bring in perspective from America because obviously America has had a much more sort of um, complicated i'm not going to say their racism is more complicated and things like that but there's a very um poignant race is a very poignant kind of place in american um culture and society and it's all well and good bringing that over here so we can understand better you know kind of perspectives on racism but again the uk you british culture british um government british society is different from the us so it's all well and good bringing this in but what about 
the black British voices. Mm. Yeah. Those people need to be heard. And it has more of a relevancy because, you know, it's all, well, again, like I said, it's all well and good learning about racism because racism is the same everywhere you go. But it also, racism also changes um, according to the system, according to the government, according to the society you're in. Mm. So we need to hear more from our people, so to speak, because, you know, it's kind of like, even when we try to diversify and we try to hear about racism, in a way we're still kind of overshadowing the very people we are supposed to be paying attention to, who are black British writers and other ethnic minority writers who come from Britain. Mm. Could I ask a question on that point? Yeah. Um, in terms of expanding the voices that we hear, should it just be down to English literature to do that? Um, it's about like the other, the other humanities, history, politics. Um, because me personally, since I haven't really been exposed to a lot of um, different voices in terms of English literature, lots of the places I got that from was actually just non-fiction. Um, mm. Some books, for example, British by Afua Hirsch, Natives by Akala, mm. Black and British by David Lola Sugar, Imperial mm. Intimacies by Hazel Carby. And I feel like that's done more for me than English literature had in terms of making me understand these perspectives, educating me. So. So what, what limits do you feel like English literature can have in terms of doing this? Should it just be down to English literature or should it be to the other ones as well? I think it definitely should extend to history, geography and politics because... And yeah, because I just feel like with those subjects, there's, the, there's a strength in like the history there. And again, if that's neglected, then people start to believe that their reality isn't as important mm -hmm. and on top of that I'd say what English brings that maybe history doesn't is kind of an emotional aspect I think English can really well there's such like a strength in words and language that I think English can really make people understand almost to embody the experiences of the people of the past but even the people people of the future and people of the now right definitely like the thing with literature why i love literature so much why i love storytelling so much is for me storytelling is how we actually deal with real human life you know like for take a, for example the gothic take for example horror you know visual storytelling or literal storytelling it's how we are able to address and actually cope with um, what we're in, we feel we're unable to talk about. Because, you know, politics, for example, like I said before, going down this downward spiral of American politics on the internet, which has been so toxic, don't do it, just don't do it, <laughs> just avoid it, you know, just don't do it to anyone out there who's listening. Um, it has, it's, it's frustrating. People get frustrated, you know? People are like, you don't agree. It's like, especially now, think about our, cu our current political climate. It's all about, you need to agree with me. Here's why I'm right. If you don't agree with me, I'm not going to listen to you. It's not about communication and learning. It's about, I'm right. I'm going to put my opinion here. If you don't agree with it, you can leave, but I'm still going to put my opinion here anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people, like, I'm going to admit, I don't have the stomach for, um, for politics because it's just so frustrating. I cannot handle it. I cannot... I do not have the stomach to keep on debating and arguing with someone and constantly having all these perspectives thrown at me. I just, I'm not okay. I just can't handle it that well. Mm. But with something like literature, where you can speak through proxy most of the time, you know, like I've realized going down this down, down spiral, politics and literature go hand in hand, just like English literature and politics go hand in hand, mm. you know. With literature, you can speak about issues without speaking about issues. With storytelling, you speak on morals, you speak on values without actually addressing them, having to actually address directly the morals or the values or the arguments, you know? Like mm -hmm. take, for example, the Gothic, um, that was used originally to explore changes in society. Women are getting more power. We're a bit afraid about it, but we don't actually want to fight the women who are trying to gain more power. We're going to talk about, you know, how sexual liberation for women is harming them. But the good thing about literature as well is that we're able to look back and we're also also able to um, see, read between the lines, so to speak, and see how people used to think, right? Yeah. Like back then, sexual liberation for women was considered horrific. It turned, you know, it made her a victim. It made her into a demon. Look at Dracula. 
But now, <laughs> compare that to now where sexual liberation for women can be a metaphor, can be used as a metaphor of her, you know, gaining freedom and liberty in her life. So I think literature is that sort of, for me personally, is that sort of um, buffer I need to be able to handle the real world, to handle the kind of intricacies, the complexity mm. of the real world. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like because I'm black, I'm female, I'm Muslim, I can't afford to be apolitical. And so with English, politics is very frustrating. And with English, okay. I feel like <laughs> with English, if it kind of filters out the ignorance and you're kind of brought to a place where you have where you have to think philosophically, you have to think hypothetically. If I was in this situation, what would I do? Or if I was given this opportunity, what would I do? And so I think English is the perfect balance between fantasy and reality. And I think that's what makes it different to other humanities. Mm -hmm. Okay, and from that, I want to ask what novels, poems or plays have you read that you feel should be taught or given a wider platform or even put on a school reading list? I'll go first. Um, I think one that, even though it doesn't resonate with me entirely, but I still feel like it resonates with me is American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin by Terence Hayes. Mm. I feel like this should definitely be put on some sort of curriculum somewhere. Um, it's a series of sonnets by a black author called Terence Hayes, and it explores racism in Trump's America because it was written just a, just a, just after Trump was elected as president mm. and it, it explores microaggressions you know racism here and there and I feel like it's something that's very relevant for our times and easing in discussion um, helps create alternative perspectives to people who would have otherwise ignored them. So I definitely feel as though it's something that people should explore, people should look out for. Mm. Mm. Um, Sarah? Um, okay, so I'm gonna admit I did not prepare for this. <laughs> so Rinkia, you go first so I can like do a okay. little thinking. Okay, well, I really enjoyed James Baldwin's works, right? And I've already spoken about Dark Days. I think it's just so amazing if you're looking for something short, concise, but that that tells you how it is and it's so like comforting but daunting at the same time because you realize that you're not well you're not alone in feeling lonely and on top of that i'd also recommend um if bill street could talk and that's um a romance story between two black people in america and it's it's just um the black guy was um imprisoned and you just see how that really takes a toll on their relationship but also the lives that their life for the future in terms of how they're going to bring money home or even um the family they could bring up and yeah oh also sorry this is a lot <laughs> i'm also gonna i'm also gonna recommend between the world and me i've already discussed it and um well i might have discussed it before when we were talking but um i just think it makes some really compelling arguments on how the education system is and it's written in the format of a letter to his teenage son and how he should deal with the world around him and yeah like um i remember one part where he was um speaking about how prominent black history is but how little is spoken about and even down to his experiences with black history month at school he'd be shown non-violent videos and so they're trying to con condition him to not respond to the racism that's so ingrained into the system but i'll um, leave that there you oh yeah <laughs> um uh yeah i didn't prepare for this so like yeah but um basically mr miles sent me a book in the post called um girl woman other it was shortlisted for the women's prize for fiction and it was the winner of the booker prize for 2019 mm. it's by bernadine everisto she is um, a black british author and i think she like got um an obe or an FE, mm. FE or something one of those yeah mbe sorry and um basically it goes back to 
I think the whole idea for me of literature and escapism, like me being a young black female who wants to become a writer, um, my kind of whole idea about literature is I want to provide an escapism for um, black people. I don't want to ignore the problems that black people go through. I don't want to ignore the problems that minorities go through. But I think that um, specifically as a young black female, I don't see a lot of narratives that portray me as just a person. No, just the normal, ordinary girl who's going through life. It's either I'm, you know, a slave master's fool, or you know, I'm, I'm someone who lost a boyfriend to police brutality, or you know, I'm someone who is learning to love her hair. I have, I have not gone through any of those things, or I've already done those things. You know, I never went through the thing of, oh, I'm so ugly because I'm black. I was never taught that. I was from a young age told that I'm beautiful the way I am. So I think this is a good book to read because it's like, yeah, you want to experience, um, you want someone who reflects your, everyone wants literature that reflects their experience. Everyone wants to be able to read something that says and thinks in their head, wow, this is me. This is me on a page, on the pages of a book. And I think it's important to read literature that not only explores the issues and problems you go through, but also portrays you as a person, that reflects you as a person. Literature that also, you know, looks at everyday worries you go through as a person, such as, you know, trying to find the right hairdresser that's not going to mess up my edges, trying to, you know, <laughs> learn how to cook certain meals so I don't go to Oxford and eat cheese, pasta all day, you know, and, you know, trying to, you know, trying to, you know, finding, you know, trying to integrate parts of my African culture into my um, dress, trying to justify why I like rock music to my friends who think I'm not black enough, you know? So, I would recommend not just this book, but find, like I said before, literature that reflects your issues, that reflects your problems, but also reflects you as a person. Don't be victimized. Don't just read literature that victimizes you. You're not a victim. You are a person. And you can have both. You have struggles and you have a life to live as well. Yep. I love that. No, go on. <laughs> no, that's, that's it. Just, oh. just find literature that reflects both of those things. Yeah. But I love that. And to finish, I'm going to use another quote because I'm cliche. So, <laughs> so I'm going to say, uh, so James Baldwin in Dark Days said that the irreducible price of learning is realising that you do not know. And I think that's powerful because I think in literature there's something, something magical in the sense that you're experiencing your own reality, you're experiencing your own reality whilst being in the shoes of someone else's life. So... I'm going to finish that. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Guys. More discussion.